Welcome to The Cap, where we are here to speak with college reps and other professionals in the field of college admissions to help answer all your questions and guide you through every step of the process. So if you're serious about college admissions, you've come to the right place. Are you ready? Let's talk about it. And now, here's your host, Dr. John Durante. Welcome to The Cap, the College Admissions Process Podcast. I am your host, John Durante, and I am here to introduce you to college admissions representatives and other professionals in the field of college admissions. Our purpose is to serve you, the students and parents, so that you may gain insight straight from the people who ultimately make the decisions. Regardless of whether you apply to a particular school being highlighted in a given episode, you should listen to all of them, as each guest will give you tremendous insight and advice on every aspect of the college admissions process, prompting you to come up with your own follow-up questions for when you visit campus or meet with a college admissions representative yourself. Don't forget to visit our website, www.collegeadmissionstalk.com, or the show notes of each episode to access the alphabetical list of all the colleges available with the related audio link to the right of each school. The alphabetical list provides you with on-demand access to all of the episodes so that you may listen whenever you wish. And if you want to receive links to episodes before they are released on the podcast, along with other related resources, please fill out the email opt-in form also available on our website and in the show notes of each episode. Lastly, please email me with any questions or comments at collegeadmissionstalk at gmail.com. So are you ready? Let's talk about it. Welcome to The Cap, the College Admissions Process Podcast. I am your host, John Durante, and it gives me great pleasure to introduce to you today Andy Wright, who's the Associate Director for Recruitment and Outreach. He's here with his colleague, Jen Sloan, who's the Assistant Director for National Recruitment and Outreach, both at the University of Cincinnati, of course. Andy and Jen, welcome. So glad to have you. Glad to be here. Thanks for having us. It is my honor and pleasure. So we'll take a question each. The first one, we're going to start with Andy. What is it about the University of Cincinnati that you love? And what are some of the distinctive academic programs or majors that set it apart from other colleges and universities? I think one of the things that I like most about UC, University of Cincinnati, is the fact that we do have three distinct campuses that gives students an opportunity to start at either our uptown or Clifton campus, uh, that downtown urban environment, which is uh, our flagship location. But we also have two two two-year regional campuses in Blue Ash and Claremont that give students a much smaller setting, uh, work towards associate's degrees that will either allow them to go directly into the workforce or uh, to transfer, or in our case, transition uh, to Uh, the Uptown Campus. Uh, I also love the fact that we are uh, the global uh, birthplace uh, for co-ops and are still uh, in the top four in the nation, the number one uh, public institution in the country in terms of co-ops. But even those students that don't do the co-op experience, one of the things that I am most impressed with about UC is the fact that 100% of our students do some type of experiential-based learning. Uh, That means clinicals, undergraduate research, student teaching, study abroad, or the aforementioned co-ops. This is all part of our Bearcat promise, which says we want students to graduate with more than just a degree. We want them to graduate with that resume uh, and and be marketable and have a plan for their future. Uh, And then I think finally, one of the last things that I really appreciate about this institution is we are a large public research institution But at the same time, we have some very specialized programs, such as our uh, College of Design, Architecture, Art, and Planning, um, our College Conservatory of Music, which is one of the most renowned in the country. Uh, And so students can get some unique opportunities and uh, in some cases, smaller colleges within that larger setting. Well, that's fantastic. You mentioned three distinct campuses, your co-ops, which is one of the top in the country. Now, I know what that means, but Andy, as a follow-up for our listeners, in case someone doesn't know what co-ops means, could you just elaborate a little bit for us, please? Absolutely. So I often uh, ask students at college fairs and high school visits if they have ever heard of a co-op, and many 
some will raise their hand, but many say, oh, I have no idea what co-op is. <laughs> uh, and, and so I, I ask them, do they know what an internship is? And in many cases, they understand the concept of internship. It's been explained to them. Typically, an internship is that part-time experience while they're going to school so that they can get some experience in the field. In our case, a co-op is where you are actually, uh, after your first year and a half in most cases, you begin this co-op experience where you are working full-time in the field, getting experience, and you do that instead of going to classes. And so you alternate class, work, class, work. Uh, and so you're able to bring what you're learning in the classroom into that real world experience and then take what you're learning in that real world experience and bring it back into the classroom. And one of the best things about UC is that every one of our co-ops is paid. We vet them. We make sure they're quality, that the student is going to get a great experience. And on average, students are earning about $10,000 in our co-ops wow. each time. And so if they're in a program with five co-ops, they may graduate earning anywhere between fifty and $60,000 through that experience. Well, that's terrific. And of course, it's something that they can use for spending money or help mom and dad with uh, paying for the college costs, right? So that's terrific. And again, what it means is you're working full time in the field of your choice as part of your college experience. So you're getting real world experience while in college, which will hopefully prepare you right for your career afterwards. So, Andy, we appreciate that overview. And Jen, welcome again. Many students are interested, of course, in all of the clubs that the University of Cincinnati offers. So could you describe some of the most popular or unique clubs and organizations available on campus and how do these enhance the overall student experience? So there are over 600 clubs and organizations on our campus. Um, so like many schools, we have social, philanthropic, major related organizations. Um, I say to students often, you name it, we likely have some version of it. Um, hmm. But we actually checked with a few of our students on what they would say are some awesome. of our more unique organizations. Um, Rally Cats is a really popular one. That's an organization um, essentially that gets um, students involved in kind of in our student fan base um, at our athletic events. So they are the ones that are responsible for getting the crowd excited and involved and engaged um, and at really all of our sporting events. So that's a pretty popular one. Some of our more unique ones might include um, we call AeroCats. So that organization, students design, build, fly, and compete um, with UAVs and RCs in national intercollegiate competitions. Uh, we have a combat robotics team. Um, I hmm. would imagine maybe rather timely, we have an organization um, for Taylor Swift fans um, <laughs> where they meet throughout the semester to do what they describe as Taylor Swift themed activities, which I actually wasn't sure if I was going to mention. And it came up from multiple students. So it seemed hmm. important to make sure that we noted <laughs> that was available. Um, we have a lot of major related um Activities. One kind of cool one is students have a chance to participate in the American Institute of Architectural Students. So some really cool ways to potentially engage in a um, pre-professional manner before graduation. Um, along the lines of recreational involvement, we have a disc golf club and a dodgeball club. So not just intramurals, but formal clubs dedicated to them. Um, and another one that came up as really popular is our Care Foster Club, which is an opportunity for students um, essentially to learn how to foster animals and get engaged in local fosters within the Cincinnati area. So that's a pretty popular one as well. Um, and I would say all of these really give students an opportunity to connect with each other. Um, I think a lot of them help them learn time management skills and gain leadership experience outside the classroom as they prepare for professional careers. And I think one of the things that's really cool about getting involved at Cincinnati is you will find a common theme with many of our students is they tend to be pretty highly engaged in the campus community, but there's not really any one organization or any one thing that you have to love in order to be able to find your fit. And I think that's a really cool aspect of what we have available to our students. 
So we really appreciate that overview. It really does sound like you have something for everyone. And I truly love that you actually talk to some of your current students to have them give their input in terms of the clubs and organizations that you guys have on campus, which, you know, is an obvious testament to the great community feel that you guys have at UC. So again, Jen, we really appreciate that. And Cincinnati, of course, is a vibrant city with many cultural and professional opportunities. Now, you touched upon some of this already, Andy, but how else does the university leverage its location to benefit students academically and professionally? Well, one of the things that's fantastic about Cincinnati uh, in terms of the city is it is home to six uh, Fortune 500 companies in terms mm. of their headquarters are based here. This is this is their home base. Uh, and it's also one of the most vibrant startup ecosystems in the nation. Uh, approximately 400 of the Fortune 500 companies have a presence here in Cincinnati. And this really uh, benefits us in terms of um, that, that, that co-op experience we, we talked about earlier in terms of giving students an opportunity to actually do that right here uh, in their home market. Uh, with that said, obviously, co-ops are done nationally and internationally, but it gives students the opportunity to not have to uh, leave, relocate. Um, and so that's phenomenal. There's also all sorts of big time amenities here in terms of professional sports teams, uh, the arts and museums, cultural attractions, festivals, things that just happen naturally in a large city are going on and giving students that opportunity not just to have a life here on campus, but also that life off campus, uh, in downtown, in the neighborhoods surrounding the community, uh, giving students a lot of things to do and keep themselves occupied. Um, uh, as we always talk about, in some of those neighborhoods off campus, they can still get that small town charm mm. uh, living in that bigger city environment because of these different cultural neighborhoods around campus. Um, uh, and this is not something that we decided. This is something that um, uh, was decided by others, but we are the number one best city for new college grads, according to Smart Asset. Uh, and so uh, there's that opportunity uh, for students to continue on here once they've graduated. Well, we appreciate that. And no wonder why the co-op experience is so rich in Cincinnati, which is a city that has six Fortune 500 companies as their base in Cincinnati. In addition to that, you have hundreds more from the group of Fortune 500 companies, pro sports, arts, museums, life on and off your campus is certainly sounding so rich and we appreciate that overview. So let's talk about the application review process, which of course is something that students and their parents are so interested in. Jen, could you provide insights into the application review process at UC and what are the key factors that admissions offices consider when evaluating those applications? Absolutely. So I think one of the things that's really important to know about our process is that students apply directly to their major, which can impact a little bit of what that process might look like for them. There is an exploratory option, so don't panic if you are someone that doesn't yet know what you want to do. There are options mm -hmm. available for that. Um, but in general, you will select something to be considered for in the review process. Students can also select up to two majors to be reviewed for. Um, we are a Common App school, so Common App will allow them to put two major choices. And really, it's a personal choice. If you would like to list two, you can. If you are only interested in one, um, we don't evaluate how they utilize that major choice process. Just like them to know that that's what it is. The actual review process is what we would call very holistic. And so what that means is we're looking at a variety of factors in that overall review. Um, I would say the transcript and grades certainly matter quite heavily in this process. We are looking at the actual grades that students have earned, the types of classes that they've taken, the rigor of some of the courses they've taken, especially in consideration of what's available. And I would note, too, that we do know rigor and what's available for students can vary pretty broadly. So we do take that into consideration when we're looking at a transcript as well. Um, we're also looking at grade trends. Some students have been really solid and steady all throughout their high school career. Others maybe started out strong and have struggled a little bit. Um, some may have started out not so strong and are just soaring now. So that's very much a part of our process. We are also looking at the list of their extracurricular activities. 
Uh, that's a really important part for us. So as I mentioned before, with student involvement on campus, a very common trend for our students in the application process is that many of them tend to have been relatively involved before they get to UC. Again, there isn't a specific activity that we're looking for, but what have you been doing with your time? And I think remembering that that could include a part-time job, that could include being particularly involved with helping your family or your community. It doesn't only have to be within the walls of your high school. Um, we do read your essay. So a real human reads the essay that is sent to us. And I do a lot of work with students on essays and try to remind them that this is really your opportunity to tell us something about yourself that we really can't gauge from anywhere else in the application. And there's not really a right or a wrong topic. Only you know what we really should know about you to kind of complete some of this picture. Um, we do not require a letter of recommendation, though we often say that one is optional. And I think a lot of times can be helpful and insightful for students to include one of those. And I'm not going to get too far into test score because I know that's a question that's coming. But I will say if a student does send a test score in their review, it is simply part of the review and it's just another piece that's a part of it. It really doesn't change anything about the overall review process itself. Hi, John. This is Cami from the University of Michigan. My favorite thing about Dormify is how supportive they are with all things college. Dormify is truly like a big sister guiding you throughout the entire college journey. From relatable content on social media to tips on how to maximize your space, Dormify has the answer for everything. I highly recommend incoming freshmen, college students to check out Dormify on social media for all things college. Thank you for listening. Thank you, Cami, for sharing your thoughts on Dormify. For those of you listening, be sure to check out our show notes where you could find our Dormify affiliate link and our most updated coupon code where you can save 15% on most Dormify products. As a reminder, our podcast does receive a small commission for purchases made through our affiliate link, but rest assured, we only promote products that we believe in and feel would benefit you, our listeners. Thank you and best wishes to all. Well, I appreciate that, Jen. And you talked about the fact that students do apply directly to their major. There's also an exploratory option in case someone is undecided. You also may submit students' applications and be reviewed for up to two majors if you wish. What you look for, obviously, the transcript, it's the academic piece, right? That's what you see on the transcript based on the context of what the student had available at their high school. What were the great trends over four years? Those extracurricular activities in terms of the type of community member that you're going to be once on campus. Admissions reps, students, they're able to determine that based on what you did during your free time in high school. And I really appreciate that you talked about jobs or even helping a family member. Students, if that represents you and who you are, that's something that is very important to put on your activity sheet because it might be the reason why you're not part of, let's say, four or five clubs at school because you have these other responsibilities. Now, Jen, you talked about the essay being your favorite part. So as a quick follow-up, is there an essay that really stuck with you that said, wow, this, this was a very thoughtful essay that you could share with us? Just curious. Oh, gosh, that's a hard one. I, I have read a lot of great essays, and I think I feel like the common thread of a great essay is it's really written true to your own voice. You're mm -hmm. not trying to make it something it isn't. And also, a concern I feel like I hear often from students is, what if I haven't had something awful happen in my life to write about? <laughs> this doesn't have to be awful or sad. It could be really exciting and enthusiastic. Or there's one essay that I circle back to often from a few years ago that a student wrote about coming from a large Italian family that gathered every Sunday for family dinner and did a really great job of referencing how the role that they each had within dinner preparation kind of aligned with what some of their roles were like within their family. And then also kind of tied that into coming to realize how much he valued that as he's thinking about being excited about school, but knowing that means that he won't be there every Sunday to participate. And I love it as an example because it's a relatively simple topic, but I finish that essay feeling like I really learned something about that student. And I think that is ultimately the goal of the essay. Well, I appreciate that. And it goes to the fact that, as you said, it's not really about the topic, 
but it's about being able to write where the admissions rep truly hears your voice, right? So that it's adding to the overall application. We always talk about the transcript is the academics, the activity sheet, what you did outside of the classroom. That essay is the one opportunity, students, for you to really give your voice, not ChatGPT's voice, your voice. So again, we appreciate that, Jen. And Andy, Can I what add one are, more thing? Oh, please, please, please. So the one other note is University of Cincinnati does also have a supplemental essay hmm. question that asks why you've chosen the major that you've chosen. And I think this causes students a lot of stress at times. It is not a trick question. We are genuinely wondering why you are interested in the program that you are considering. And some of our programs will look a little bit more closely at it because they are um, maybe a little bit more competitive program. Nursing often is looking very closely at that answer. Um, I would say that's a program that not only is highly sought after, but really, I think, thought of a little bit more of a calling as opposed to just a job that somebody's going to have. And so they are genuinely curious in what has drawn you to this particular major and program. So I always say to students, Try to think of it in the voice of if somebody asked you why you're planning to study this program, what would you say? Um, it doesn't have to be especially long. It does not need to be the length of your Common App essay, but a good two to three paragraphs giving us a little bit of insight into why you're considering that program. Well, I appreciate that, Jen. And, you know, a question that comes to mind in writing that supplemental, you know, why the major that you chose would it be beneficial if the student in that supplemental is also able to articulate why the specific program at UC? In other words, what is it about that program, how they see themselves there, how they see themselves contributing? If they're able to articulate that as part of the supplemental, would that be helpful in their overall application? I would say it's not a requirement, but it mm -hmm. can be a lovely addition. I would say when I encounter essays that include that, I appreciate that they have done a little bit of homework and background on why they're interested in this particular program. I appreciate that. So again, there's no guarantees, but you know, it's always appreciated to see that they did a little extra homework, I guess. So again, Jen, we really appreciate that. And Andy, what are the different ways a student may apply to UC? And is there a benefit to applying one way over the other in terms of admissions or even receiving any merit-based scholarships? For our um, Uptown campus, the flagship campus, there is only one way to apply, and that is through the common application. Uh, and we, we often talk about uh, having for that application a priority deadline uh, and then a rolling deadline. And so uh, students must apply by our priority deadline of December 1st to be considered for things like merit scholarships uh, or our honors program. Uh, if, uh, they wait until after December 1st, um, they may not be eligible for certain programs because some of our more competitive programs will close on December 1st. Uh, but we do have the ability to apply, uh, up until normally around March 1st. Uh, sometimes we extend that. So we say March 1st is the earliest, but then sometimes we've extended it, um, for the Uptown campus. For our two regional campuses, students actually will apply through our institutional application. Uh, and uh, that is open. The deadline is uh, July 1st uh, for them to apply. Um, and one of the things that's important to know is if a student applies to the flagship campus, the Uptown campus, and then decides, I would prefer to be at one of the regional campuses, they can just let us know and we can change their application. So they do not need to submit a second application in those cases. Well, we appreciate that. And I'm going to emphasize again that priority deadline of December 1st. And Andy, as a quick follow-up, I was just curious, you know, me being from New York, are there any restrictions in terms of the percentage of students that you could admit from out of state or even out of the country? No, we do not have a limit on the number of students coming right. from out of state, uh, whether uh, domestically or international. Well, I appreciate that. Thank you so much. And Jen, what advice would you give to prospective students to make their application stand out? I know that, you know, you touched upon this a little bit already, but to make their application stand out in the selection process. And are there any mistakes or misconceptions that applicants should be aware of? 
So we get this question very often. And what I say to students is, I think the best thing that you can do is make sure that you're doing the best job you can showcasing yourself, your involvement, your achievement, and really focus on that aspect of it. Um, Some of our more competitive programs are what we call pooled review, where they will get an individual review and they'll also be looked at in relation to everyone else who is applying. Um, Others are going to be direct review. And I think even in a pooled review situation, um, it's looking at the merit of your application. So I think making sure that you include everything, because it happens every year that we read applications where the counselor may do a great job mentioning a few things that the student is involved in. But when we've actually read the application, the activity list is blank. And mm. it it's hard for us to know whether that means they just weren't involved in anything or they didn't remember to include all of that information. And more often than not, it's that they didn't include it. And I think that's just doing a disservice to yourself and not sharing um you know, what your participation and involvement has looked like um, and making sure that all of those pieces are there. I think another common mistake, so we are a common app only school. It's the only way to apply to Cincinnati. We do not have an expectation that you are going to name University of Cincinnati in that main essay, but we would prefer not to read about how enthusiastic you are to attend an institution that is not the University of Cincinnati in that essay. So I think it would be um, advisable to just not include it. I would say that the supplemental question is really the place that you can invest in telling us about your enthusiasm specific to the school. Um, And also using the same essay for both essay prompts. So sometimes students will just copy and paste their essay. And that is probably not taking best advantage of the opportunity to tell us both about yourself and why you're interested in the program. And I would even go so far as to say there are times that students write really wonderful essays about themselves and their interests that happen to tie into why they're interested in this particular program. I would still say it would be worth spending a couple of paragraphs saying something slightly different in the supplemental piece. Well, I appreciate that. And it comes to the fact, again, of understanding what each part of the application represents. And students, you want to put your best foot forward in each part so that, you know, you're not creating a disservice to yourself. For example, you don't want to mention another institution when you're applying to UC. You don't want to leave a part blank, as Jen explained, because when you do things like that, first of all, it doesn't make you look good. But if there are parts that are missing then you're leaving it up to the admissions representatives. And correct me if I'm wrong, Jen and Andy, if there are parts missing, then, you know, they're leaving it up to you to speculate as to Mm -hmm. what's going on. And that's never a good thing in terms of trying to create the best marketing package, the best application to help you students be a a, a viable candidate in this case for UC. Anything else you guys want to add about that? You know, I feel like I would be remiss not to mention something about AI just because it's Mm -hmm. become so common. And I would say the one thing that I have noticed is um, when a student leans towards a resource like that, you're really doing yourself a disservice because it isn't your voice and it isn't your story. And a computer doesn't know how to write with emotion, Um, whether it's good, bad, or somewhere in the middle. So I would say trust yourself that you are the best person to tell us about you. I'm so glad you said that because AI, although it'll generate an essay that's probably grammatically correct, it can't express your emotion, students, and it can't represent who you are and your story, which again is what the admissions reps are looking for because that essay, that general essay is really the one place where you're showing off your authentic voice, not of chat GPTs or someone who's going to write the essay for you, right? So I really appreciate you saying that. And I know that we touched upon it briefly earlier, but Andy, standardized testing policies vary among universities, as we all know. What is UC's stance on standardized testing requirements for admission? And how does the university evaluate applicants holistically? So... Uh, We are very excited to be able to say uh, for the first time for this uh, coming fall, we are test optional for every 
single program hmm. and major here at the university. We're excited about that. We've been test optional, but we've had one or two holdouts here and there that have still required the test. Uh, but moving forward, test optional for all of our programs. We are still evaluating that uh, every other year or so, uh, but that is uh, the expectation. Um, and in terms of the holistic piece, you know, I think one of the things that stands out is I recently had a conversation with um, our um, specialized admission staff that work with nursing. Uh, and that team said, you know, it's, it's not just the highest GPAs or the best test scores if they're submitted that we are looking at and taking when making a decision. We are looking at that entire application uh, as as Jen mentioned, uh, the work on the essays, um, the involvement that the student has had, the types of classes they've taken. Uh, and when we say involvement, I, I, I do want to go back to that. What types of involvement do they have, especially if some of their involvement has been uh, a part-time job or volunteer opportunities, in nursing's case, in a hospital or clinical setting? These are the things that our various different majors and, and colleges within the university are looking at when trying to decide which students do they want to have part of their program. Once again, it goes back to something Jen said. It, it's not just the smartest students we're looking for. We're looking for the best students, those students that are well-rounded, those students who uh, have time management skills, who are willing to work hard, and who have a passion for the major that they have chosen. Uh, and so for us, that's what that holistic review looks like. Well, I really appreciate, first of all, that you mentioned that you are test optional for every one of your programs. And I'm particularly happy that you mentioned nursing because there are a lot of institutions out there that say that they are test optional. However, for their more competitive majors, they may require testing. So students, parents, it's very important to be aware for each of the different universities, colleges that you're applying to, these nuances. So obviously, look at the individual websites for the latest and greatest information. But I, I like how you mentioned that even in your nursing program at UC, you know, you're not looking at tests because you're really using that holistic approach. It's not just about the standardized test. You want to make sure that you're admitting students that are well-rounded, that display great time management and who are frankly passionate about that program. So, you know, we appreciate that. And Jen, student support services are obviously crucial for ensuring that academic success and personal well-being continues once they're on your campus. So what resources does UC provide to support students in their academic and even their personal development? So in short, quite a few. Um, I'll give you a little bit of a list so that you have a little bit of an overview. I would say academic advising is certainly a large one. All of our first year students participate in what we call learning communities that are groups of about 25 students, um, typically by their major, but that can vary a little bit if they're within exploratory studies or something along that line. Um, that is really a large support within that first year. Um, our academic support services are within our library. So things like our writing center and peer tutoring, very easy for students to find and access. Um, we have quite a few identity-based centers and organizations, a veterans resource office, a Bearcat food pantry, a Bearcat Promise Career Studio that not only provides support in preparing for interviews, but if a student um, is maybe a little short on the money that they may need to be able to dress for the interview, there's an opportunity um, to have support for that. We have an accessibility resources office, which is where a student who maybe had a 504 or an IEP in high school um, would go and, and really at any point in the admission process to have some conversations around what that support could look like for them on our campus. Uh, we have a Gen 1 housing opportunity for first-generation college students. Um, they can apply to be part of a living learning community that is um, both full of and supported by students who are all first in their family to attend college. Um, and we're consistently looking for opportunities to help students transition to any of our campuses very well. Um, our first year to second year retention rate have consistently been above the national average and over the last 10 years have fallen between 86 and 88%. So it's something that we're really proud of that not only are we helping you get admitted to UC, but helping you be successful and stay. 
Well, I think it's great that you mentioned the retention rate because it is so important. You're well above that national average. And it goes to show that in the admissions office, you work really hard to get the right students to represent that freshman class. But perhaps more important, once they're on your campus, you have so many resources for each and every one of your students, whether it's peer tutoring, your accessibility center, and everything else that you mentioned, to make sure that they continue to be successful once they're on your campus and ultimately graduate and move on to either graduate studies or a career. So we really appreciate that. And so, Andy, speaking of having something for everyone, what about aspiring student athletes? How does the application process differ for them? And what advice would you provide in terms of making their intentions to play sports in college known? Well, I I would say that the application process itself for student athletes uh, is the same as it would be for any other student. Uh, The the lead up to that application may be different as uh, coaches are in the recruiting process, reaching out to them and their families, uh, in some cases as early as, as their sophomore year, uh, and doing that type of outreach. But once they apply, that application process is no different. Uh, there is no indication on our application whether someone is a student athlete or not. And so they still must meet the admission requirements uh, that we have for the university and for those individual programs. I would say that for students who are being recruited early, Uh, by our athletic teams, or I should actually, let me rephrase it. For students who are looking to be recruited uh, by our athletic programs or want to express an interest, uh, they can make themselves known to us uh, and their interest in those teams uh, through a perspective question or a prospect questionnaire uh, on each team's website. Uh, And so whether it is our football team, a track and field team, uh, women's soccer, et cetera, et cetera, uh, they have an interest in being part of uh, a major conference in terms of the Big 12, and they want to make sure we know of them uh, just in case uh, they are not already on our radar. Uh, I, I encourage every one of those students to fill out that prospective student questionnaire. Well, I appreciate that. And whether it's your Office of Accessibility or your athletic website, if there are any links that you want me to include in the show notes, I always uh, link the Office of Undergraduate Admissions, obviously. But if there are any other links, Jen or Andy, please provide them to me and we'll put them in the show notes. So, Jen, looking towards the future, what exciting developments or initiatives is UC undertaking to enhance the student experience and academic offerings? And How do you see the university evolving in the next few years? So one of the biggest things is the development of new housing opportunities for our students. As we have continued to grow, we've had growing interest in continuing to live on campus. So over the next three to five years, we anticipate about 2,500 beds coming online, um, which we're really excited about. Um, A constant review of academic programs with opportunity to continue to add new things including this fall, a gaming and animation major in our College of Design, Architecture, Art, and Planning. Um, So I know that's something a lot of people will be enthusiastic about. Um, Continued growth of our experience-based learning opportunities. So we mentioned co-op is one of the things that we're best known for, but all of our students are going to have some type of experience-based learning opportunity, um, regardless of their major. And the university always has an eye on continuing to grow what those opportunities are and look like for our students. Um, And then finally, another exciting development is that we're adding an adaptive sports program beginning with the fall 2025 admission cycle. So lots of new and exciting things coming in the next few years. Well, that's awesome. And again, it does seem that you have something for everyone. And this has been a tremendous conversation. I want to thank you both again. But before I get to the last question, Andy, is there a question I didn't ask today or a topic that I simply didn't bring up that you'd like to share with us now? So one of the things that I thought was interesting uh, is in fall of 2022, across our three Mm -hmm. campuses, we had 48,000 students on these three campuses. And at the time, a 19 to 1 student to faculty ratio. So students still had a wonderful opportunity to really get to know their faculty. In fall of 2023, we actually grew by 3,000 students uh, Hmm. to just under 51,000 students. And yet our student to faculty ratio did not stay at 19 to one. It actually changed and went to 18 to one. Uh, (laughs) UC continues 
to invest in our students, both in and out of the classroom. We really want to make sure that our students have the chance to excel. And so we're going to continue to keep an eye on things that we can do to improve their opportunities because we know that if we invest in them, they will have great opportunities to graduate and then invest in their own communities later on. Well, that's awesome and so true. And again, we really appreciate this conversation. Unfortunately, it does lead us to that last question, which is what are, and by the way, you gave a lot of pieces of advice already, but what would you say are your top pieces of advice that you would give students getting ready for the college process and their parents? So I would say a few things. I think most people in admission would say something that's really important is to visit campus. Um, you can look at all of the wonderful things that we share, but you really benefit from getting to visit and and just get a feel for the campus itself. Um, something that I think is sometimes unexpected from our campus is that you really can't drive through it. So even though we're very urban, it creates a very traditional on-campus experience for our students with the city all around us. And in some ways, I think you really have to see it to, to fully understand that. Um, one thing I would say the summer before senior year, um, in addition to working on visits, I think probably the best thing a student might do um, as they're narrowing their college list is also spend a little bit of time on that Common App essay. I think the essay itself is what tends to slow students down the most when they get closer to deadlines. And so if you get that one piece out of the way over the summer, it may speed up the rest of the process for you later on. Um, and then also, please feel free to reach out to us. Um, so many times people reach out and apologize before they ask their question. We are here to help you. We want to help answer your questions and help this process be a little smoother and a little bit easier. So please, please feel free to reach out with questions that you may have. And finally, I would say have fun. This is often a very stressful process, but it's also a really exciting time in your life to get to do this exploration and think about these next steps. So try to also enjoy and have fun with it as well. Oh, well, we appreciate that so much, Jen. Thank you for your time today. Andy, anything you want to add? You know, I, I would echo a lot of what Jen said. Uh, when it comes to the application process, uh, start early. Don't wait to submit your application until the very last moment. Um, we, we continue to hear horror stories of students all of a sudden having an issue right before or a life emergency happening. Just get it done early. Uh, you know, um, I would also uh, echo what Jen said in terms of uh, that process of identifying the colleges. Um, I continue to read in the, in the paper uh, or online uh, or hear stories uh, about students who are applying to a hundred different schools and earning the hmm. hundreds of thousand dollars in scholarships. Ultimately they can still only pick one. Right. And instead of spending all of that time and energy and money in, in applying to all these different schools, narrow that choice list. And as Jen said, go visit, find out which one's in your heart and apply to those that you think um, really are the places you want to be. And then the last thing I want to make sure every high school student hears, your high school counselors are an amazing resource. They actually do know what they're talking about. Uh, they are there to help you. They can give you great advice on colleges in terms of figuring things out, knowing where to look for information, uh, utilize them, uh, and, and then make sure to thank them afterwards because Trust me, you're going you're gonna, to uh, benefit from all they've had to offer. Absolutely. School counselors are absolutely amazing. And I'm so glad that you gave them a shout out, as I would like to as well. And I also want to thank you and Jen, because UC is so lucky to have you, as were we, on this podcast episode, as I know it's going to help so many students and their parents as they navigate through the process. I hope to have you both again soon. Thank you so much, folks. Thank you for joining us on this episode of The Cap, the College Admissions Process Podcast. We hope you enjoyed the show. If you did, please don't forget to tell a friend and follow us on Facebook, Instagram, Twitter, and wherever you listen to your podcasts. I am your host, John Durante, and I look forward to seeing you on the next episode of The Cap. I want to welcome back Sean Patel, who's the CEO and founder of Prep Expert. Sean, thank you so much for being here. How are you? 
Doing well. Thanks for having me, John. Just wanted to do a quick shout out for an amazing deal that we have for college admissions process podcast listeners. We're offering 30% off all prep expert SAT and ACT courses in tutoring. It's live online. We've got the best score improvement guarantees in the industry. You'll get taught by 99 percentile instructors. And you can save 30% off when you go to the show notes of the College Admissions Process Podcast. Grab your discount code for 30% off and click the link in the show notes. Thank you, Sean. So great to have you again. And to everyone out there, please note that if you make a purchase through any of our affiliate links, the podcast gets a commission. But rest assured that we would only promote products that we believe in and feel would benefit our listeners. Thank you all and best wishes.